भूत भूत भूतेश्वराय काल काल कालेश्वराय शिव शिव सर्वेश्वराय शंभ शंभ Namaskaram. Namaskaram to everyone. Well, the last week has been uh, 
in many ways, uh, whatever expectations and plans people were having, once again, it's been smashed because the world has crossed ten million mark of tested positives. Total death toll has crossed half a million. 2.6 million cases in United States alone with 130,000 deaths or more. India has crossed half a million cases or 16,000 deaths in the last 24 hours, 20,000 positives. Uh, in the five major cities in India, it is surging up with the relaxation. Once again, states are going back into severe lockdown mode because the relaxation has worked against the whole process. Well, as I think earlier also I have said, the administrations have done what they could do, the doctors, the medical staff, the police and other administrative staff trying to enforce this. I think in many ways they're reaching towards exhaustion and frustration because uh, ordinary citizens, though most of them have behaved responsibly, a certain percentage of them everywhere in the world are <laughs> they're God's children, what to do? <laughs> they are going about their business in their own way. In many ways, uh, the police and other staff involved in the management of people, medical staff is beginning to really tire because uh, everybody was geared for maybe three weeks or six weeks, now it's on for uh, nearly three months. And once again it's surging up, you can see and feel the effects of this frustration and exhaustion all over. It's very important. It's very important as citizens of this nation and the world that we don't push the medical staff especially to a point of collapse. Many of them have shed their lives. If you push the medical fraternity and the system to a point of collapse, after that, uh, virus will have a free-for-all. Right now, there is a fifty-eight or nearly fifty-nine percent of those who go positive in India are recovering, which is the highest in the world. But uh, that number we will lose, that is our only hope. Right now, people are recovering because of medical attention. If the medical systems and people who man it collapse, under this pressure, then this recovery numbers will go down and that's not good. At one point, Coimbatore City was declared as uh, COVID-free, but once again, it's an emergency condition that lockdowns are happening, enforcement is happening forcefully. <sighs> Sometimes force is unfortunately getting out of control, so, uh, WHO and other agencies are talking about a mental illness pandemic, as if the virus pandemic was not good enough. Now, people are causing mental illness pandemic, it's growing, people are getting mentally frustrated, sick and fearful, loss of livelihoods, loss of businesses. If things close 
for five to six months or more, then a whole lot of people know what happens to them. All this is causing an enormous amount of turmoil, as if that was not enough. In India, we have a little bit of a warlike situation going on. So, uh, every citizen, whichever country you are, wherever you are, you are lucky you are not administering your nation at a time like this. So whoever is administering it, whatever differences you have, whatever problems you have with them, till this virus situation passes, everybody should stand up and do our best because uh, this is not an enviable job to be managing any country for that matter, particularly a nation like India, which is as complex and diverse as it is. I think largely it is in the hands of the citizens now how responsibly we behave. Well, I've been in continuous webinars almost one or two per day and uh, this question is coming back again and again, that's what I'm telling them, see, uh, I'm using all the people who are here at the yoga center and saying, see, suppose I give an instruction to everybody here, fourteen days, just stay in your room, close your eyes and sit, we'll provide you food, they will all sit. If we could do to the whole world such an instruction and they would follow, the entire pandemic would be over in fortnight. But unfortunately that's not possible. People can't sit in one place. So essentially it's human uh, compulsiveness which is taking the virus places. You tell them don't go here, they will go there. Tell them don't do this, they will do that. And many people are saying that whole virus is fake information. <laughs> don't laugh, it's a big moment by itself. <laughs> It is all fake, made up by somebody, somebody, whatever, for whatever reasons. I wish it was fake. <laughs> they are also on the social media attacking me, he is supporting this fake virus, he is creating fear among people. Well, every society has a right to produce a certain number of nutcases. But all these nuts are super empowered because of social media. Earlier there would be people would dismiss them, but now they're all over you because they become super active in times like this. So this is where we are and uh, there are many, many challenges for everybody on the planet for the administrations, for the big businesses, for the small businesses, for the employees, for the labor, for institutions, for everybody there is a massive challenge. Challenges are times when we should rise, but unfortunately challenging times are the times when people sink, a whole lot of them. This is not new in the world. There have been terrible wars, there have been natural calamities, there have been pandemics also. But when these things happened, a few people rose to their heights, to the best possible way a human being can be. A few people slithered down to the lowest possible level they could be. This is always the case. But it's my wish that in this generation, when our ability to communicate with the world is like never before, it'll be great if majority of the population rises to the occasion and does their best. What is the worst that can happen to us? Um, 
Worst case scenario, I'm telling you. This will not happen. Other things will happen before that. The worst case scenario is, we may end up living how we were living here about twenty-five years ago. When I say twenty-five years ago, for example, if you take the yoga center as an example, how were we living here twenty-five years ago? Let me take it two years further back, twenty-seven years ago. In the same month of June, we moved in here and uh, it was... that was one of the heaviest monsoons we have seen. At this time of the year, see how calm it is now, winds were blowing like sixty, seventy kilometers per hour here on the ground. In the mountain, it was uh, blowing at hundred and ten, hundred and twenty kilometers per hour. As I've told you earlier, I think, about twelve people were blown off the mountain. They went to the peak and they were just blown off by the wind and they died. So, uh, all we had was just one hut which we called Kaivalya Kutir, real Kutir it was. And about twelve bathrooms only for the ladies to use, men were going into the forest. Well, still uh, we very blissfully did our sadhana and everything. One night, uh, I had a small room outside of this hut, about six, sixty-eight participants and maybe about eight to ten volunteers, all sleeping in this one single hut. I have a room and the wind is howling in the night around 1.30 a.m. I just woke up and uh, <clears throat> I saw wind was howling, I looked out of the window, all the trees were looking this way. <laughs> then I looked out at the hut, I could not see, I took my torch and flashed it. Then I saw the, the entire Kaivalya Kutir was at this angle. Then I got up and ran. I ran into the hut where all these people, over seventy-two or seventy-four people were sleeping, or more than that, about seventy-five, seventy-six people were sleeping. And all of them were sleeping peacefully. <laughs> Outside the wind is howling and blowing at a great speed. And then I try to shout at them, nobody hears. Then I turn on the lights, <laughs> because the sadhana was like that during the day. <laughs> they could sleep through a cyclone <laughs> So then I have to shake everybody and wake them up and scream at them and get... Come outside, let's fix this thing because this may just collapse on the people. So there were guy wires which were like uprooted because of the wind force. So in the night around 2 a.m., we work for about three hours to straighten up the hut. Using uh, the only jeep we had at that time to pull the hut back into place because it was going at that speed, the wind, none of us could actually... If all of us got together, we could still not pull it. So we used the jeep, in that rain, slipping all over the place, and all this was happening, one tree collapsed. It's okay, I have audience coming <laughs> in the rooftop. Look at the interest in the darshan. <laughs> <laughs> but those of you who are not here, the monkeys are on the roof <laughs> So, uh, a tree fell where we were working and uh, fortunately nobody was badly injured, only one person was hit, that too not very badly, it was okay. 
in a couple of days he recovered. Then we knew uh, next day we couldn't stay there in that hut because it was precariously balanced. So we had to do some structural changes, but we didn't want to stop the sadhana. So we went up the mountain, where there is a... there are a, f uh, a few small caves, which could barely accommodate about eight to ten people. It was pouring rain, day and night. Three days we stayed there. Every day morning, five-thirty, guru puja, sadhana, entire day, class. Well, you couldn't speak much because it was howling, the winds and raining. But the sadhana was kept up, no one flat place, everybody sitting in all kinds of places. Only thing we had to eat was, we were just frying green gram and eating for these three days. But everything went on. So that's how it was twenty-seven years ago. So, uh, suppose we have to live like that again on green gram, fried green gram. Are you on, I'm asking? Yes. Everything should go on, not sit and cry green gram, green gram. <laughs> so I'm saying, everybody, wherever you are, tw fifteen years ago or twenty years ago, nothing was wrong with your life. Well, since then everybody in the world has much more than what they had at that time, everybody. Almost without exception, maybe a few unfortunate societies have gone back because of war and tragedies that have happened. Otherwise, generally almost everybody is having much more than they had twenty years ago. But twenty years ago we were all fine. And uh, suppose it goes to that point, this is the worst, worst case scenario. Suppose it happens, why can't we still live joyfully? It's almost like our life was wound back twenty years, now we have a new opportunity to once again create this twenty years in a more sensible and ecologically sensitive and in every other way humanly sensitive ways that we can do things. Because the way we have been going in the world, fundamentally today everything is driven by the economic engine. Everybody is only talking economy because that's all that seems to matter. The way we have been driving this economic engine, if you really look at it, the engine is on, roaring, full on, providing more and more and more things to everybody. But if you look at it carefully, nobody has the steering wheel. You have a vehicle which is roaring at full speed, but nobody has the steering wheel. This has been the case of human development for, for a long time, particularly in the last twenty-five to fifty years. We don't know where we are going, but we are going, that's all we know. In many ways, if you look at it, we are driving this vehicle like there is no next generation on this planet, we are the last. So in a way, I know people will hate me for this, I am not saying there are no troubles, not just for you, for everybody there is trouble. For everybody there are serious challenges, everybody will have to adjust their lives in so many different ways. My only concern is that nobody should starve. If people are well nourished, rest is okay. Instead of having uh, twenty pieces of clothing, you have two. What's the big problem? Actually, you need only one to wear. All right, when things were doing well, we did many things. If it is not so, we'll roll back. This doesn't mean to say, we have to become miserable or lo lose our mental balance and suffer the rest of our lives. No such thing. This means we have surrendered to a microorganism. That's the most horrible thing you can do to human nature. So, wherever you are, whatever you are, this is the time for you to rise and show what are you made of. With what little that may be there at the end of this pandemic, 
openly now, till now there was hide and seek, now openly they are saying, <clears throat> it is hallucinatory to think that there will be a vaccine at the end of this year. Openly they are saying this, it is very, uh, <clears throat> you know, dreamy dreamy to have a vaccine by the end of this year, if it comes, it may come sometime around this time next year. And first, it will be given to all the medical personnel and then like this, whoever is more exposed to them, it'll be given, slowly it'll come. By the time it comes to the whole population on the planet, it may take anywhere between twenty-four to thirty-six months. Even if you go at full production of vaccine and try to vaccinate everybody on the planet, it'll take that much time if it happens super efficiently. So, twenty-four to thirty-six months, or even if it is twelve months, twelve months uh, means lot of things will naturally shrink and shrivel in terms of our activity. Only thing is, we as human beings should not shrink and shrivel. It is very important, every nation, India is doing the right thing, focusing on agriculture. Every nation should do this, focus on agriculture, ensure there's substantial amount of food everywhere. Somebody may not have the money to buy it, it doesn't matter, we can just give them the food to eat. There must be enough food on the planet, this is the most vital thing. Because if food shortages come, then it will go into another mode. Once food shortages come, it's simply impossible to maintain law and order, it'll be impossible to maintain civic balance in any nation, it'll go out of control. So it's most important that every nation should focus on it, everybody who has a piece of land should see at least uh, nothing else, at least there's a papaya tree or a murungai tree or a <laughs> something else. Everybody should see how there is enough food on the planet, particularly governments in their policy and in their focus, because now going to the Mars is not the most important thing. <laughs> yes, we need to understand because wanting to be ahead of somebody, uh, satellites are being shot off, you know? It's very, very important that everybody conserve, step back a little bit, ensure people don't die of starvation on this planet in our generation. This much we must take care. Rest of it, if it rolls back, it's all right. Instead of driving a car, we'll cycle. Bonus is health. <laughs> if you cycle, bonus is health and you will look slim and trim. Yes, what you always wanted, which did not happen by driving the car, can happen. Or you walk to your office, or you walk wherever, or you dig your garden and plant something, you, things will work. I'm saying, when things do not go as we expected them to go, it does not mean a disaster has happened. There is no disaster if you ask me. Unfortunately, nearly over half a million people have lost their life and many people have lost their loved ones, that is a disaster. But the virus itself is not a disaster. If human beings are conscious, we can handle this. If we address this responsibly and consciously, human societies are capable of handling this. It's still so many people are not getting the point. That's the whole problem. And nations are not getting the point, trying to take advantage of each other. If we get this point, we can easily handle it. As humanity, we can handle it. As individual people, as communities, as nations, if one against the other, well, it will become a real disaster in terms of fatalities. But as a humanity, if we come together, this is not much of a challenge we can easily contain it. Economy will roll back a little bit, but as long as there is food on the planet, su sufficient food for all the people on this planet, we shouldn't really break our heads on economy. 
economy is a problem when this guy is getting rich and I'm getting poor. Now all of us came down a little bit. It's not a big deal, I'm saying. It's not a big deal. Uh, maybe nations will pass laws and regulations to balance it a little bit in the near future, it may happen, it's going to be difficult. But difficulty is not necessarily a disaster. You can make it into a disaster. If you become fearful, if you become frustrated, if you drive yourself into mental instability, or unfortunately many people are on the verge of suicide or some have committed suicide, if you drive in that direction, it'll become a disaster. Otherwise, from two meals, suppose we come down to one meal, can we still go on joyfully? Say, I am one meal and I'm fine. Well, it'll be a little hard initially. Uh, we will eat fried gram. We'll do something. But I'm saying, difficulty is not necessarily a disaster. Only if you're completely bereft of any joy and love in your heart, then it becomes a disaster. Otherwise, our difficult times come. Actually, if you look at a whole lot of people's lives who work from very simple backgrounds to, you know, a very successful stage, any number of people that I've spoken to, they always say, when we started this enterprise, when we were working so hard, that was the best time of our life. Right now we are living so luxuriously, everything that you want we have, but it's not the same. This is a common story everywhere. That is because those who address difficulties, seeing the challenge as a challenge and take it on, for them, challenging times are the best times. I make sure it's always a challenging time out here. <laughs> yes, it's very important. Otherwise, when awake, people will sleep. We are looking at how to produce a generation of people who will be awake even when they're asleep. That's my goal. But now most people are asleep when they're awake, suddenly little difficulty comes and they're now awake and they find it shocking. Nothing, difficulties are okay. Let us not transform difficulties into disasters. Disaster can only happen because of human attitude towards the difficulty. Difficulty by itself is not a disaster. Every year, you know, we were trekking, this year they've cancelled the Kailash trek because whatever is happening between two nations. Uh, is it difficult? My legs, my thigh muscles and my calf muscles have cursed me to death. Why are you taking us through this treacherous terrain every year, year after year? Yes. Uh, but uh, the difficulty, because of the difficulty I am living without ever going to a hospital, not a medical checkup. I've always been saying when I go to Kailash, uh, normally we are touching close to eighteen thousand feet above mean sea level and climbing. If I fail the test, you can bury me there, that's it. I've been passing till now, this year no test. So one year I'm going without a medical test. I'm saying difficulties, every human being who is enthusiastic about life is choosing difficulties by choice, isn't it so? Somebody treks a mountain, somebody wants to fly, somebody wants to go through uh, very difficult enterprises, ventures and adventures. Because if you are full of life, you naturally choose something difficult and dangerous. If you have no life, then you will only choose comfort. Now this has become the thing, everybody talking about their comfort zone. It's a death zone <laughs> Because 
the most comfortable place on the planet is the grave. Nothing hurts, believe me. Otherwise, if you're pushing yourself, always something hurts. <laughs> In my body, always there's an injury somewhere. I've had endless number of fractures. These days, fortunately, last twenty, twenty-five years, I've avoided fractures, but muscular injuries, this, that, because you do something. If you simply preserve yourself like a mummy, then nothing hurts, everything is fine, no difficulty. So difficulty or what you think is difficult is actually just a situation that is challenging. Don't call a situation by any negative name. Oh, big problem, big difficulty, big disaster, no such thing has happened. It's different. It's different from this… in the last four months, life has become very different from the way you have known it. People are going through all kinds of things. So many people that I know, their parents are dying somewhere, they cannot go. They're not even able to attend the last rites of their parents. They're not able to go support them because they're in a COVID hospital. Travel ban, you cannot travel. They're dead, you don't even see the body, you cannot conduct the last rituals. It's just done by the government, we don't know what they're doing. So I'm saying it's difficult. It's not easy, it's difficult. But I want you to know, most people who've been committed to doing something significant in their life have always chosen these kind of difficulties. Yes, when, you know, there are any number of examples, you think a Mahatma Gandhi or a Martin Luther King or a anybody else in the past who've done anything significant, they went back to bury their loved ones, you think so? Did not happen, because in those days there was no way to fly back anywhere. If you go somewhere, you got the news after three months. Three months ago, your mother died, your father died, this is how you got the news. And well, you dealt with it because because you know that you're doing something significant enough in your life. If you're not doing anything significant in your life, then your own emotions and your own attitudes become super significant. In that you will suffer, in that there is a whole lot of mental turmoil, in that you may become mentally sick. Right now, pandemic, the virus pandemic is bad enough. We do not definitely need a mental ailment pandemic. We definitely don't need it. Well, there are a whole lot of people who will argue, how can we avoid it? It just happens. I want you to know it doesn't just happen. You take a wrong direction, you keep going in that way, one day you will hit something. Till you hit, you think you're all right. But it's very easy to know that if you go here like this towards the wall, it's just a question of ma time before you knock your head on it. There is a doorway, you need to go that way. So because these directions have not been set, let me give you a simple GPS so that you don't hit walls and rocks with your head. The simple thing is just this. First and foremost thing to understand is, human experience is caused from within, never from outside. The moment I attribute my experience of life right now, I am angry, I am unhappy, I am miserable, or I am joyful, or I am blissful, the moment I ascribe it to something or somebody, well, you are going towards mental disruption. When it's going to happen, how resilient you are, how resilient are you, or how fragile are you, will determine how quickly this disaster will happen to you. But you are heading for a disaster. 
then how many people are vulnerable for a disaster? Unfortunately, too many. It is just that they have not yet faced situations which will push them in that direction very rapidly. Now if this pandemic lasts for long enough, disrupting our lives, our economic structures, our family structures, we may lose people who... that we love in our lives. When these things happen, they will be rapidly pushed to the wall. But if this one thing you understand, always, always, it doesn't matter, somebody is born, somebody died, this happened, that happened, you lost your limb or about to lose your life. Even if that happens, if you know human experience, no matter what, joy or misery, agony or ecstasy, pain or pleasure, is all caused from within. You have a handle on what is the experience of your life. Once you have this handle in your hands, then you determine the nature of your experience. Once you are determining the nature of your experience, you will make sure it will pleasant. It is pleasant, especially if the outside has become very unpleasant because of the challenges that life is throwing at us. It's all the more important that I keep my interiority very pleasant. This much responsibility everybody must take. We have a substantial problem in the country and in the world. You don't stand up and create your own freaky problems. Please take care of this, every citizen of this country and wherever else you are. This much you must take care. At a time like this when humanity is being challenged, this is not the time for you to you becoming a volcano of problems. We'll give you another time for that. If you must freak, I'm saying. Please. This question is from Decent Divan. Whoa! <laughs> Respected Guruji, I'm a Buddhist and a Vipassana practitioner. I have a question which I have asked many Vipassana teachers and other gurus. But everybody said that no one can answer this. <laughs> in one of your video you mentioned, and also it is said in Buddhism, that rebirth is due to our unfulfilled desire or karma. I accept this, but then a question arises, let us suppose I took birth for millions of times because of my karma desire, but before my very first birth, there was no body, no mind, karma, desire or nothing of me existed. Then why and how that very first birth came to existence? Now, uh, even I'm wondering about that about you. <laughs> well, <laughs> No, you are a decent guy, I am like this, what to do? <laughs> Let's take that question further back. It's not just about your birth. Well, in the yogic culture, there are theories which are explained in the form of dialectical stories, how uh, Shiva, was like Shava. Shava means a corpse. He was inert, phenomenal energy but inert. Then energy or Shakti came and danced around him, upon him, then he got kind of woke up. Well, we are, uh, you know, picturizing it as a man and a woman, but that's not what we're talking about. Inert means nothing happening, no reverberation. No reverberation means no creation. Energy got introduced, reverberation started. From a simple basic reverberation, it got more and more complex. As reverberations became more complex, it became matter. Matter became small molecules, they became planets. Planets became many things, life happened, variety of things, you know the evolutionary theory from there on. Evolutionary theory only starts after life has started or at the beginning probably, but if you go back, 
creation itself. We may not know the exact trajectory of how it happened, but we approximately know how it happened, even as per modern science. So in the modern scientific parlance, the same thing is said today that if you apply energy, not even into it, just around it, suppose you create vacuum in a container and apply energy not into the vacuum, just around it, uh, virtual protons and virtual neutrons will erupt. That means creation begins to happen. Proton, neutron uh, just have to get together for an atom to happen. Once an atom has happened, creation has started. So similar things are said in modern science. I don't want to go into any theories, but Obviously, creation began somewhere. Somewhere means it may not be within the projections of human mind in terms of time, because it's not one, but in the yogic system, there have been estimates that there have been eighty-four creations till now, eighty-three creations till now, this is the eighty-fourth one. And up to one hundred and twelve, cycles of creation can happen. Beyond that, creation will be material-free, just pure energy creation. But we're talking in terms of maybe billions of years or trillions of years, I don't know. But those projections are made. Well, obviously it's just a theory. Nobody can prove or disprove anything about it. But it looks like a plausible theory because the markings of eighty-three creations are there in our system in various aspects of life around us. The markings of eighty-three and this being eighty-four are there for those who look very closely at it. So how did you such a decent guy happen? Well. So this question doesn't go that far as I took it just now. It's talking about if I did not have karmic substance, how did I happen? That's a question. Well, you don't need a spiritual answer. Charles Darwin himself has explained this. You were a single-celled creature and then you became two-cell, then you became three-cell, then you became multi-cell. Now you become little more little more only, decently better. A decent development from a single cell has happened. <laughs> so, in the process from the single-celled animal, from an atom to a molecule, right now this is a wonderful time to ask this question because there is virus. A virus is not a full-fledged life. It has proteins and enzymes to make it a life, but it's not yet life. Only when it enters your cell, it has a life. But in… by itself, it has no life, just a certain combo of protein. So decent… Uh, what? Dushyanta. An Divan. Oh. So you were also pre-life, became life, became more and more complex life. Complexity itself is karma. Karma is not necessarily, even now as you sit here, karma is not necessarily only what you do like this. The thoughts that pass in your mind are karma, emotions that pass in your mind right now are karma. Simply, a thought just passed in your mind. You looked at the person next to you, thought, why is he here? He should be on the roof with the monkeys. <laughs> Just like that, you know, sometimes thought like this, come, hello. So this karma just happened in a routinely, not caused by you, caused by the monkeys dancing on the roof. So because monkeys came there, you looked at this guy, at a certain angle, he looked a certain way to you. 
maybe it's the lighting, maybe it's the way he sat, maybe something, and a thought came and went. Now you performed a karma. That somewhere you look at another human being and you think he's a monkey. Now this won't stop here, you understand? Now you looked at him and thought you're a monkey, tomorrow we change your department and you're in the monkey department. <laughs> oh my God, I have to work with this monkey today. It will continue. And if suppose the situations are placed like that, he is in charge of the department, you have to work under him. Do I have to be instructed by a monkey like this? It will grow. And this is how you became a racist, all right? <laughs> because initially it's just a passing thought. Then depending on situations, how they corner you here, there, there, slowly it multiplies. This is even happening to every other creature. So gradually, karmic substance builds up, builds up, becomes more and more complex. Well, clearly, evolutionary sciences are telling us the initial human beings were very, very, very simple, half-bent human beings, very small brain, they couldn't think much, they just survived like any other creature. Everybody knows that, right? So from there you built your karma. I don't know why nobody could answer this question for you, everybody knows this. Maybe they thought you are not worth answering. <laughs> because uh, I am such a fool, I don't think anybody is not worth answering. Because I don't think any question is not worth answering, I am taking all kinds of idiotic questions from all over the world <laughs> So, this is also because maybe you have some conclusion of your own, it's not really a question, you're testing everybody with your question, so they might have said, this happened. A committed, uh, you know, marijuana is legal in many states in United States. So as a man who is committed to this, because a lot of people are approaching it like a philosophy, it is not just a compulsion that they have, it's a philosophy, we smoke, so we are superior to you. Yes, there is something called as endocannabinoids that you can generate within your own body. That means whatever the cannabis does, you can do it in your brain and your body. That is why cannabis receptors are there. Because you are a malfunctioning system, you're not able to generate your own thing. See, right now, suppose you are not able to secrete enough uh, thyroid juices, then they will put thyroid into your system. You're not able to produce enough hormones in your system, they will put hormone into your system. You're not able to produce enough insulin in your system, they put insulin into your system. Similarly, because for some reason you are a malfunctioning machine, that you are not able to produce your endocannabinoids and be blissed out, you're putting from outside. But the difference between endocannabinoids that you generate and you're blissed, and outside one also may cause some bliss, but it also causes certain dislocation of your intelligence. Never before has it happened that someone who is blissed out because of his meditative nature ever left off a mountain and thought he's going to fly. But many smokers and LSD takers and drug takers have done this. So, uh, this committed, uh, in US these days they're calling themselves stoners. Back to Stone Age. I am also stoned but not a stoner, just stoned. So, uh, he called the fire brigade and said, my house is on fire, just come quickly. How do I get there? The fireman asked. Come on, get into the big red truck and get here. <laughs> what to do? What to do? So right now, you're wasting your time very indecently. 
because these are all questions of the vein. Because mainly your questioning is towards whoever those... I don't know who are those people that you ask questions. In some way you want to make a fool out of them. That's all you're interested in. You're not interested in knowing anything about yourself. You're not interested in having tools for your transformation or growth. You said you went for vipassana. Tch. Vipassana means no questions. <laughs> Simple instruction, just do it, do it, do it and do it. Because that is a process which demands perseverance as the greatest quality. Gautama taught vipassana to large groups of people because there was no time to prepare them. He was every day moving from village to village, town to town, no time to bring understanding into those people. So no teaching, no question, just simple instruction. Get the instruction right, just do it, do it, do it. Slowly it will transform you. It's a a very... a bit of... a bit laborious process, but a fantastic process that even if you have no clue what you're doing, if you just do it, slowly it will transform who you are. When I say transform you, every aspect of you, including your chemistry, gradually it will transform. It's a laborious process because in those times, you must understand he was teaching twenty-five hundred years ago. Twenty-five hundred years ago, the common wavelength of the society was not intellectual understanding. The common wavelength of the society which lived hard lives was perseverance. People could persevere. Today, to make them persevere, you have to talk to them for hours and hours and hours because they think they understand everything. Those days, people had no such problems. They knew that they don't understand. So you had to just you had to just instruct them and say, do it. And uh, those were good times for the gurus. <laughs> because if you give an instruction and say, you must do it, you just do it. You know, my mother, some yogi in Nandi Hills, she... she... once we went to Nandi Hills and she showed me the cave where she was initiated. She gave... Uh, that yogi gave her some mantra, I don't know who he is anyway. And she never had a picture or she wouldn't even talk, you know, utter his name. But every day she did something with eyes closed. Right through our li life, we've been her life, you know, four children, husband is her life. She married at the age of seventeen and that's her life. But before that she was initiated and this yogi told her, whatever happens with your life, you must do it every day. Every day she is doing something with her eyes closed. We say, what are you doing? Say, well, this yogi gave me a mantra, I just do it. We want to know what's the mantra <laughs> So we played all kinds of tricks on her, tried to compel her emotionally, uh, what? Blackmail her. You tell us this mantra. Such a gentle and easy person to deal with, always she was, but... Uh, not once, no matter what, either to her husband or to her children, she ever told the mantra because the yogi said, you don't share this with anybody. I mean to say it was so easy to instruct them. If I tell you, keep this to yourself, you'll put it on the social media. So, because giving instruction was very effective and simple in the previous generations, especially twenty-five hundred years ago, Gautama chose this path, no understanding, no teaching, obviously no questioning, just do it. Only to those who gathered around him, who traveled with him, who were in close uh, association with him, to them he taught shunya because that needs understanding. Without bringing substantial understanding, that won't happen. So, you went to Vipassana. 
that means you must just shut up and do it. Not ask this question, that question, because that question will... Uh, that question or the answer will not in any way add to your practice. The practice has been designed in such a way, irrespective of who you are, if you do it, it will work. It's just that it's a bit laborious. You have to do it for hours every day, for a long period of time, but it will work. It's a fantastic device for those times. Even now it is for a whole lot of people. So, don't waste your time. The decent thing for you to do is... <laughs> if you're here, I don't know where you are. If you're here, take instructions and just do it. Otherwise, stick to the vipassana and do it. One way or the other, take one forward step. Rather than standing in the same place and looking all over the place, it won't add to your life in any way. It's just that in foolishness you will think you're smart by gathering these things. Maybe now I've said what I've said, you will go and tell somebody else, you know what Sadhguru said, this is what it is, even he doesn't know. Or you will make it your answer and put it on the social media. Whatever you do, it's of no use. Existentially, if you want to move on, you must do something existential within you. You do psychological things and you think you will move on, you will not. You know what is my handicap? You want to know? Simply, being straight and honest is my big handicap. Yes, no deviousness, this is my handicap, what do you think? Tell me, Sadhguru, it's not a handicap. Hey! Some of my advisors think this is a handicap, I'm too straight and blunt about too many things. But, that's the way I will be. If you don't like it, <laughs> Next question is from Sneha. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I understand the logical explanation of being conscious, but there are moments when I am really compulsive. For example, for certain kind of food, I know I am being compulsive and I need to be conscious, but I am still not able to do it. Is there a mantra which can make me conscious and stop me in those moments? Oh, you don't need a mantra. We... Uh, there are simple devices which could do this. After his meal is over, every day, uh, just about six inches of duct tape. <laughs> At least with the mask on these days, you must shut up a little bit. Hello? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you have a mask on, you better talk little because you're sounding ridiculous with the mask on. Huh? So, uh, for compulsions, mantras won't do. We need some devices. Either we can put duct tape or we can lock you up in a room. So simple, you know, it won't... it'll work. Or you do it yourself. When you say, I will not open my mouth, do not open your mouth. Namaskar <laughs> Yoga Yoga Yogeshwaraya Bhuta 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 Shwaraya Kala 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 Shwaraya Shiva Shiva
said this many times to you, 